Father, we do thank You again for Your Word. And we ask You to draw our hearts into that flame of fire called the beauty of Your Son. And Lord, in this session, continue to open the eyes of our heart. And we thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, session six, the spirit of revelation again. David perceives God's beauty. David perceives God's beauty. The spirit of revelation. David perceives God's beauty. And uh, you will receive these notes next week. So the notes that you have right now uh, go with uh, last week's. Most of you understand that, but some of you were trying to follow along here and couldn't, were trying to sort out what was going on. I'm creating this class week by week as we go. So I give you the, the notes a, a, a week late. <clears throat> Okay, Psalm, I mean, Session 6, the spirit of revelation. David perceives God's beauty. We're going to look at Psalm 19 and Psalm 29 in this session. Psalm 19 and Psalm 29. <clears throat> but let's look at Psalm 19 to begin with. The new anointing upon David gave David a new ability to perceive the beauty of the Lord. The anointing of the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to see the beauty of the Lord, the beauty of God, throughout His works and throughout His creation. David now looks at the same things he used to look at. He used to look at casually, and now he's looking at them with an enlightened heart. He's looking at them with an illumined mind. And I don't mean that it's so uh, in another world that nobody can relate to it. But David looks at the sky now and he sees the handiwork of God. Now, he always understood that the Lord was the author of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the universe. But as the Spirit of the Lord is drawing him close to the heart of God, he looks up there and he sees something new when he looks up to the heavens. And that's what we want the Word of God to do, the Spirit of God, to renew our minds so we can see the beauty of the Lord literally all through the works of the Lord. That was one of the uh, hallmark of some of the, some of the uh, great men, men and women of Christian history was their, their ability to worship the Lord when they perceived His beauty through His creation, through the works of His hands. Now, we all do a little bit. But my goal in this session is to give us an awareness that there's much more that God would show the illumined heart. There's much more that the heart of a lover will see when they look at the works of the one they love. And it's more than just, isn't that flower beautiful? It's more than that, because unbelievers can recognize a flower is beautiful in itself. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing the sunset or seeing a flower and being brought into the understanding of the beauty of the one that created it, not just the flower itself. Humanists can see creation and see beauty, but they don't see the heavens as the work of His hands. They see the heavens as, you know, just the process of evolution. What happens in Psalm 19, it's one of the great Psalms, and I know I've said that like eight times already tonight. But the truth is, I'm, I'm bringing you in this course to the well-known, the famous Psalms that, that most of the, of the scholarship through, through uh, Christian history has put its time on, and certainly Psalm 19 is one of those. Psalm 19, Psalm 19, David has studied three different books on the beauty of the Lord. There's three different books, and I'm just speaking in figurative language here, that da David has studied while he has tended the sheep of his father Jesse. Verse 1 to 6, it's the book of creation. The book of nature. That's verses 1 to 6. The book of creation. He has looked up to the heavens and he has studied with devotion. The book of creation, if you will. And he saw the beauty of the handiwork of God. He saw God's heart. He saw God's skill, God's design. The second book that David studied in his early life as a young man was verse 7 to 11. The book of Scripture, the Torah, the five books of Moses. He studied the book of Scripture. And the third book that David studied was verse 12 to 14, the book of the worshiping heart.
the book of, a, of the worshiping heart. He studied the human processes of the worshiper and what happens on the inside when a worshiper encounters the beauty of God in creation, the beauty of God in the law of God, in the Word of God. There's a beauty that begins to emerge in the very heart of the, of the worshiping lover of God, the worshiping heart. It's the beauty of being a voluntary lover of God. And probably one of the greatest statements of mature, voluntary love ever recorded in the Scriptures, recorded there in verse 14. David says, I want to go all the way. I want to go to the very innermost part of my being, to where my thoughts and my words, it says, are acceptable. Another version adds, it's, it's the same word, pleasing, where the very thoughts and the very utterances of my mouth bring pleasure to you, God. There's no greater crowning achievement of maturity than when words and thoughts are captured into the river of God's love. Now obviously that's the ultimate, that's the pinnacle. That's the book of the worshiping heart. That's the heart, that's mature bridal love at its very highest. When thoughts and words, that's what's happening to the 144,000 in Revelation 14. Whether that number is figurative or spiritual or, or, or symbolic, I, I, I mean, whether it's, it's literal or figurative or both, the Lord has so many ability, I mean, has such ability to operate on a number of levels at one time. You know, concerning the book of Revelation, people tell me, you know, there's three or four main theories of the book of Revelation. Some people say the book of Revelation happened. You know, it all was fulfilled in the first century. And there's quite a, a theory uh, as to how that symbolism was fulfilled in the first century. Other people say, no, it was fulfilled through the last 2,000 years of church history. For 2,000 years, it's progressively unfolded. And another group comes along and says, no, it's a book mostly about what happened at the end of the age. And they kind of all debate again, you know, about it. And they say, no, it can't be this, it's got to be that. I say, why can't it all be, why can't it be all three of them? God's literary skills are so fantastic, and it probably has ten other levels we haven't thought of yet. God has the ability to speak at any level, at many levels at one time. And I believe that that's what's happening. Here in Psalm 19, God is speaking at many levels at one time. And this is the Psalm, uh, I was talking of the 144,000, whether they're figurative or whether literal or both, they enter into it's believers, surely it's believers at the end of the age, and it's whether it's been uh, believers throughout the age, I don't know, but I know it's believers at least at the end of the age, where their thoughts and their words come into full obedience. The words they speak and the thoughts they think are captured in divine love, and that is the fullness of what he says here in verse 14. It's the seal of, of Song of Solomon 8, verse 6. It's the seal of fiery love. This final book is written, it's a living epistle, Paul said about the church at, uh, Cor uh, at Corinth. He said, you're living epistles written on your hearts by the finger of God. And each of the books, the book of God's beauty in creation, the book of God's beauty in the Scripture, and the beauty of God seen as love is matured in the human experience. Each dimension of that beauty intensifies in the, in the progression of these three uh, stages of Psalm 19. It's an absolutely fantastic psalm. It's, it's a summary psalm. Again, each phrase, each sentence could be a book title in and of itself. The three books of the beauty of God. We see it in creation. We see the beauty of God in the Scripture, describing God's acts and, and what He's done. And then we see the beauty of God in His work in fashioning and reforming the human heart in love. Now, all three of these books are written by Jesus, and they're read by the person with a worshiper's heart. They're read by the person that has a worshiper's heart. Because, see, an unbeliever can look at the skies and see nothing. They see a magnificent scene, but they don't see anything but the beauty of God. But the truth is, many believers look at the skies and can get just a, a little thought of the beauty of God, but no further. God wants to develop in us the eyes and the heart of a lover and a worshiper. When we look at the works of His hands, we feel the divine romance tugging us into the first commandment, into wholeheartedness. God wants to romance His church with His beauty throughout all of creation. Oh, that God would give us eyes to see.
St. John of the Cross and St. Francis of Assisi were, were uh, prominent spokespersons for the beauty of God in creation. And it wasn't some kind of you know, Hindu kind of religion where God is in everything and that, that everything is God. But they were talking about seeing God's work and leading us back to the person of Jesus in extravagant worship. And that's what David introduces. We're going to look at just the, the first book here, the book of creation. We're not going to look at all three of them in this session. Verse 1 to 6, the book of creation. He deals with the heavens, he deals with the earth, and he deals with the sea. Those are the three things that David typically deals with when he deals with the book of creation. And I gave you those five psalms in the last session where he looks at the heavens, he looks at the earth, and he looks at the sea. Those are the three volumes of that book that David's always dealing with those three arenas. Man is overwhelmed by the mysteries of the heavens. We're baffled. We're awestruck. They exhaust the human mind, the human understanding. But God tells us that the vast heavens, I mean, the, there's a billions of stars, many, many times bigger than the sun, billions of them in existence, billions of them far bigger than the sun, billions of them. And God wants us to know that in Job 26, verse 14, a verse I've quoted a number of times over the years, God talks about His acts of creating the heavens and the earth. And He says, when I created the heavens and the earth, they were the mere whispers of My power. They were the mere edges of My ability of power and wisdom and kindness. When God made ten billion suns greater than our sun, He said, this is merely the edges. It's the whisper of exhausting My abilities. He goes, natural creation is the edges of my power. It's the whispers of my ability. He goes, it doesn't even get into the, the deep stuff of what my capacities are. Beloved, that's who we're dealing with. And God wants us to look up at the sky and to be awestruck. And He wants that holy divine romance to woo us into wholeheartedness and to wean us from the folly of living with other things in, our, in the primary place in our life. It says here in the title, in Psalm 19, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David. David is writing this to the chief musician in the tabernacle of David. Chenaniah was his name, the chief musician. He was the choir master. He was over the choirs. Or he was over the man that was over the choirs. He was the symphony director. He was over the musicians and the singers. And he was over the assembly. He was the worship leader. He was over all the musicians and over all the singers. Chenaniah. It was written to the chief musician who combined those three job descriptions in the tabernacle of David to lead the people into the worship of God. And David wrote this under the anointing and he put it to, to music. He had the instruments and the singers and the assembly of the people come together. It's fantastic. It was written specifically for worship and for music. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the word there for glory, you want to put the word there, beauty or splendor. I don't know how many words for glory there are in the Hebrew, but there's at least, I mean, I've just done a casual study of this. There's seven or eight of them or more. There's seven or eight different words for beauty. And the word majesty, beauty, splendor, and glory are often interchanged. Not, and there are some uh, rules that, that, that guide the use of the word. But from one version to another, from the same Hebrew word in various passages, one time it's called glory, the next time it's called beauty, the next time it's called splendor, sometimes it's called majesty or brilliance or radiance. And so it's, 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 uh, it, it takes some work to know exactly, precisely what was on David's heart. But you could put the word, the, sp the, the splendor, the brilliance or the beauty of the Lord. And I like the word, the beauty of the Lord, because we think of glory and we just think of, well, you know, glory to God. Well, what's that mean? Well, you know, hallelujah, glory to God. You know, uh, yeah, let's do it. You know, I don't know. And it's splendor, it's radiance, it's beauty, it's majesty. That's what he's talking about. And so I, I like to deliberately uh, interchange uh, the word glory for other words.
He says, the heavens. He goes, when I look up at the sky, he goes, it is preaching loud, but without words, the glory of God. Let's read these six verses. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of His chamber, and it rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Then He changes subjects and now talks about the beauty of the Logos, those scriptures after that. And so He's looking up here at the heavens. He says the heavens are revealing their giving understanding to the illumined heart, to the heart of the lover. They're talking about the splendor and the beauty of the Lord. And the firmament, that's the entire atmosphere that envelops the entire earth. It's talking about the, that's the, that's the clouds, the stars, the weather systems, the storms, the firmament. The, 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 it's the atmosphere that engulfs the entire globe is what he's talking about. Often when he's talking about the heavens, he's talking about the stars. In the firmament, he's talking also about the stars, but he's talking about all the atmosphere around the world. Psalm 29, which I hope to look at in this session, David describes the, the glory and the beauty of the thunderstorm and what it speaks about the beauty of the Lord. He's looking at the firmament. And he says that the firmament is his. It's God's handiwork, or it's your handiwork, the work of His hands. Again, when, when the sky is not just beautiful, but it's the work of the beautiful God, it's His handiwork, it's a completely different thing than just being beautiful in and of itself. It says in verse 2, that day to day utter speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's something about the day that reveals that utters speech and reveals knowledge, that blue sapphire heavens that many of the ancients in the Hebrew tradition in the Old Testament days believed, and, I, and, and it makes sense to me, that the blue heavens, the day-to-day, -day, the blue skies were but a dim picture of that sapphire pavement of blue that Moses and the elders of Israel stood on in Exodus 24. That the throne of God literally rests upon a sapphire expanse, a crystal clear sapphire pavement like sapphire diamonds. It's, it, be, it glitters like crystal uh, expanse is what it calls it in Ezekiel 1 and, he, and Exodus 24. And they believe that the blue heavens were merely a reflection, a dim picture, a hint if you will, of the sapphire expanse of which the throne of God set upon. And that makes sense to me. Night to night, it reveals things. That the starry nights, uh, I mean, just uh, shining with the, br with the bright stars and all the different movements in the night. So the day reveals something and the night reveals something different. But there's another point here. It's the day-to-dayness. It's the routine. It's the incessant, continuous activity that he's talking about here. It's, the, it's talking about that continuous that continuous fountain of flowing understanding every single day the Word goes out, the beauty of the Lord, it's staring at us day in and day out, day in and day out, and it's in contrast to the unreliability of man. Man is so unreliable. If man does you know, something for a year in a row, it breaks a record of consistency. Man's beauty is always fading, but... The centuries, the millenniums passed, and with regularity, day in, day out, the splendor never wanes. It's always there on its circuit. It's always there to be counted upon. So it's not only beauty, it's beauty that doesn't fade. It's beauty that differs in the day and the night, and it's beauty that's consistent. And David sees all of this. He sees the immutable God, the God of consistent, unfading beauty that goes on through every generation. He sees that. He goes, day to day, the very, the very consistency of every day would stun David as to the beauty of what God was like who caused every day to come and go and none of the luster of 
creation is lost day to day. The sun is as bright. It's not lost any of its energy. He said that is remarkable about the self-replenishing beauty and energy that God possesses. That's what David would see in the day-to-dayness. Not only does the day show something different than the night, but they're both continuous. They're, they're declaring God's majesty. It's declaring God's kindness. It's declaring the power, the brilliance, the vastness of who God is. The day-to-dayness and the different features of it spoke to so many things of the personality of God to David's heart. The actions, the very existence, the very operation of the heavens, the way the heavens operate, the laws by which they operate spoke of the wisdom, the vastness, the power, the might, the genius of God. I mean, think of ten billion suns like that. Think of the genius and the power to hold all of those in perfect order with none of its luster waning and none of its course being deviated. It's fantastic. David would get lost in the heart of Jesus, thinking that this man, Christ Jesus, eternally God, spoken by His hands, spun into being out of nothing by the words of His mouth, this very thing, and He is man, and He is our bridegroom forever and forever. This has ravished David's heart. He would just every day come back and say, It's you again! Do you ever wear out? Does your luster ever diminish? Do you ever lose course? Does anything ever discourage you? It's the same today as it was yesterday. And David would fall in love with God looking at the skies. He would say, you're so reliable. You're so trustworthy. You're, you're, so, you're such a genius. You have so much power to sustain this. You're, you're so brilliant to think of it and then to run it in its order. And it's, I love you. Look at, wow. He would just go wild. And that's what I wanted to see you do. And that's what I want to do. There's no speech, nor there's no language where their voice is not heard. There's no place in the earth. Whatever tribe of the earth that you go to, whatever language or speech, wherever you would go, every place in the earth, this voice is heard. Even though it's inarticulate, there's no words. The voice is clear. Why isn't there any speech? Well, one of the reasons why there is no speech, verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the very ends of the earth, but there is no speech and there's no language. Why not? Because it's not necessary to the illumined heart for there to be words. A picture is worth a thousand words. But to the heart of the lover, to the heart of the worshiper, which is the same thing, to the illumined heart, it's not necessary to speak at that level. God speaks where it needs to be spoken in the written Word of God. Where there doesn't need to be words spoken, God draws the heart in another dimension. And to the heart of the lover and to the heart of the worshiper, there isn't any need for language. When two people are in love, there are certain things that need to be said, and there are certain things that are actually diminished if they're said. And the Lord knows exactly the balance of His creation And He is the ultimate lover of all the ages. He's wooing His church into His heart. David hears God's voice. He sees God's beauty. He says His beauty is unmistakable. Who could not see this? The dull heart, the one who isn't a lover. They go through life and they say things like this. And I'm not not trying to to get down on anybody because I've I've known discouragement. But here's, I'm just telling you what, what we're prone to. We're prone to, in the midst of this unmistakable, Unmistakable, undiminishing splendor shining through the sky. We're walking through the maze of life. We can't see its light and its glory anymore. And we're so consumed that somebody took a little bit of our position and our, a little bit of our money and somebody, one person said something mean and they told one other person and, and we're walking our hearts on fire with anger and rage and bitterness and in the midst of this theater of glory and splendor, we can't see any of it. None of it. It all disappears. Because when our heart ceases to connect with love, we can't see the splendor anymore. And the Lord is preaching and drawing us. He says, listen, it's only five or ten thousand dollars. It's only five or ten people. And it's only one position. And I'm the God of ten billion sons. And I love you. Come. Just come. It's going to be okay. Come on, Mikey. It's going to be okay. Just sit down here. You're going to be okay, little guy. I, I'm with you. It's just five or ten thousand dollars. It's okay. You see that son up there? i got ten billion of them in their place. And I really like you. It's okay. Now look up and worship me. Because 
He's only on the earth for a moment. It's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Do you know how, how awesome it is? We don't see it. We drive home after the event or the work or the, the conversation. We can't see any of it. And it's staring at us. It's, it seems as though it's impossible to miss, but it's so possible to miss it because it takes the heart of a lover to, to engage it. And I'm saying this to challenge us. Verse 4 is an interesting list. It says, Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. The word line is a very interesting Hebrew word. I read it from, it says in the margin, their sound. And some of the versions that you have will say sound instead of line in verse 4. It's a much debated and discussed Hebrew word. There's many articles actually written on that one phrase by the scholars. And one line of thought of which I like, because it's written by David for the chief musician, Chenaniah, to bring to the tabernacle of David, that it one major argument, many, many scholars believe this, believe that the line that he's talking about is a sound. It's a musical sound. Because the line, it said, was a musical string that was stretched like a guitar string to, to emit musical sounds. And that's why the word sound meant musical sound. It's sound. It's music has gone to the ends of the earth. Paul the Apostle quotes this verse, verse 4, in Romans 10, 18. And he doesn't put line. He puts the word sound as... And the idea is the musical sound of God's beauty has gone to the ends of the earth. I just like the idea instead of line, I like the idea of musical sound. God's music has gone to the ends of the earth. Of course, this psalm was set to music. It's a love song. This song is all about the beauty of the Lord. This creation was God's love song to David. God looked at David, uh, God, David looked up and said, Oh, the music of your creation. He goes, I love it. He goes, I love the music, the sound, God. It makes no articulate noise, but the sound is, is impossible to miss. And of course, God's music delighted David, and then David's music and worship delighted God. The inaudible voice of God, its inaudible voice of God, awakens in David adoring worship back to God. The sound has gone forth. I like that, the sound. Beloved, when we're in that city, Revelation 21 called the bride, the city is called the bride not because the building material is the city, because the inhabitants and every parts of the building materials are all the Spirit of God is the source and the author of everything, and everything makes one harmonious a symphonic sound throughout eternity. Our delight in what we see, the delight that we fill the city with, with our worship and music, I tell you, it's a musical love song. Creation is part of God's love song to the bride. The city is part of the love song that God gives us. It's fantastic. Okay, let's look at verse 4 and 5. In them, or in the heavens, in the heavens, God is set. He's made the sky a tabernacle for the sun. What an interesting phrase, uh, uh, idea. It's a tent for the sun to hide in at night. What, what language? David sees the skies during, during the night. And he says, over there, he says, the skies have become a tabernacle to hide the sun. And, and of course, the, the imagery that he's work, or at least a, a, a lot of the scholars have said he's working from, is how the Shekinah glory was hidden in the tabernacle of Moses, and then in the tabernacle of David. The, the Shekinah glory was hidden in the tabernacle. So the skies hide the glory of the sun. And then in the morning it breaks out all new again to, to, to cause everybody's love to be stirred anew and to be freshly awakened. He says in the morning, he says the sun comes forth, and it comes forth in two different ways out of this tabernacle, out of this tent. It's been hidden all night. He says the sun, the sun is, is pictured as like the bridegroom to the created order. It's the source of life to the rest of the, the uh, natural order, to, to the inanimate objects. It's the, it's the source of blessing. It's pictured as the bridegroom. Of course, we know Revelation 21, verse 23, Jesus says there's no need of the sun in the age to come. He says, the sun is like a bridegroom to the inanimate creation. Like Jesus, the sun will replace the sun in the age to come. 
I love Isaiah 24, verse 23. It says the son will be embarrassed when the, when the Son of God appears. The Son will draw back in shame when the brightness of the appearing of Jesus stands. He looks at that little sun and it's all of its, its voltage and its energy and it says it's nothing. It fades in glory. This is the man, Christ Jesus, who walked on the earth, who died that you could be His bride. The Son will draw back in shame and there will be no need of that, that, uh, that intermediate bridegroom to the natural order when the Son of Righteousness appears and He illuminates the eternal city. But anyway, David, I mean, David is such a romantic, you know, I mean, the study goes, oh, it's like a man in love coming down the aisle for his bride, he goes, I love it. The sun comes out in energy, you know, the vigor of love and in the splendor of his attire, he goes, oh, the sun, you're incredible. I mean, you look at this guy, this guy was, he was in love with God, he was in love with life because he was in love with God. And that's what God wants us to do. He saw the skies as a tent and a tabernacle. He saw the sun as an energetic, vigorous lover coming down the aisle to embrace his bride. Dressed in splendor, dressed in the greatest attire that he could come up with. It's as a bridegroom. But the sun is more than as a bridegroom. It's as the rejoicing like a strong man who's getting ready to run a race. Here's the champion runner. Here's the gold medalist ten times in a row. Well, of course, that wouldn't work because then he'd be old. But just, you know what the idea of me is. He wins everything and he's there and he's confident. He's strong. He's assured. Nothing can defeat him. He's the champion runner preparing to run the race. And assurance and strength, that's the son. And David, knowing the heart of a bridegroom and knowing the heart of a champion, he sees in the son the attributes of the lover bridegroom and the champion warrior and he sees God in it. He goes, oh God, you're like that. You're the bridegroom lover. You're the champion warrior that will finish its course and the sun is only just a little down payment till then though the sun so dwarfs everything else that's close to us. I mean, it's only 93 million miles away but that's close compared to everything else. But it's so big and it's so, it eclipses everything and yet it's just a little down payment. It's just a little, little brief little reminder of reality in the age to come. When the bridegroom lover and the champion warrior takes his place in the age to come. He says from its rising from one end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end, nothing is hidden. The, the number one preachers of all of history is the sun and the stars. David is saying, nobody, all the earth, it says in verse 6, again in verse 4, all the ends of the earth, nobody can escape it. Nobody can escape it. Try as they like. When they lay down at night and look up, they have to come face to face with grandeur. They have to set their heart against it. They have to get so caught up in other things to miss its obvious message. Some hear the message, some don't. And again, it has to do with the heart of the lover and the heart of... of of, of one that is so captured by other things. The stars and the sun and the moon are the traveling preachers on their circuit going village to village throughout the earth speaking of the splendor of God. It runs its daily course, its circuit. Every day it preaches right on time. It preaches the same consistent message of that power, undiminishing splendor, the genius, the artistic abilities of God, the kindness of God to create it for us and for our pleasure. Paul the Apostle would come along and say in 1 Corinthians 3.22, all of these things were created for the saints. God made all this for us. He did it with us in mind. He didn't need it. They're, they're way too small in power to fit in the eternal scheme. The sun, the sun will be embarrassed when the age to come comes. Honestly, the, the things of grandeur in this age would never qualify. They wouldn't even be on the B team in the age to come. They won't make it. They don't have enough splendor to fit into the scheme of things. They were only made for us. They weren't made for God or for eternity. Only for us, for a few years on the earth. Only for the human race. For our enjoyment and for our prosperity. They're the preachers of the gospel. They're the introductory. Now, obviously not the gospel of Jesus, but the introductory. God loves you. Come find out more. And then it takes you to the next passage, the written word of God, where you find out specific revelation. 
I love this. Nothing escapes its heat. Nothing is hidden. You know, there are parts of the earth that can escape the light. You know, the deep caves, but nothing escapes the heat. Those caves, I don't care how far down they go, they are impacted over time by the heat of the sun. Nothing escapes the sphere and the grasp of the sun, and yet it's only a little down payment for us. It doesn't qualify for the age to come, but it draws back an embarrassment. It is no more when the age to come begins. Nothing escapes its power. Well, that's the heavens. Da David has so much more to say. Turn to Psalm 29. We'll look just a little bit at this passage, just a little overview of it. Psalm 29. <clears throat> now, this is David witnessing a, a thunderstorm. He's looking at the heavens again. Again, Psalm 19 and Psalm 29, you've got to read them together. You've got to read Psalm 8 with it, Psalm 104 and Psalm 145. I mean, they all go together. I gave those to you in the last session. <clears throat> Psalm 29 has three parts. Verse 1 and 2 is the call to worship. Verse 1 and 2 is that the first commandment would be restored to first place. Verse 3 to 9 is the beauty of God in the description of a thunderstorm. So again, David's, David's, you know, he's tending his father's sheep when all this stuff happens. You know, all the other brothers are in the house. David's out there in the thunderstorm, but he's worshiping, you know. He says, well, hey. He goes, I'm going to go ahead and worship, man. He looked up and goes, oh, God, look at what's going on up there. And I believe that his heart was illumined after the Spirit touched him. I believe, again, a little bit. We can see a little bit of the glory of God no matter what. I mean, we can get a little bit of it just if we just got a heart for the Lord. But when the Spirit of the Lord begins to draw us into deeper communion, we see an intensity of the Lord's beauty everywhere. Everywhere. Verse 3 to 9 is the second part. It's the beauty of God in a thunderstorm. And then verse 10 to 11 is the assurance of God's blessing upon our lives. The assurance of God's blessing. That's verse 10 and 11. We're still actually, Psalm 29 is just a sub-point on considering the heavens. It's, David's going to spend the whole psalm just looking at the heavens now. See, Psalm 19, that was only part one of Psalm 19. Then part two was the Word, and part three was the human heart, and, or the redeemed heart. And now it's Psalm, psalm 29. He's going to look, the whole psalm is about the heavens. He's locked in on that. David's fascinated with the heavens and the beauty of God. He just can't get away, away from it. And I believe these things were given to David in his early life. I don't know that he wrote them in his early life, but I think he did. Because there's, uh, he writes these psalms and there's no reference at all to struggle like as in all the psalms of his later life. Nobody's chasing him. He's not grieving over anything. He's just loving God. Psalm 8, Psalm 19, and Psalm 29. It's, there's this... In tremendous absence of struggle, like is so common in even his worship psalms in his later life. It's, you know, he didn't have a lot going on in the natural, but he's tending sheep, and, you know, very lonely, but boy, he was really locked in. He used it, and he locked in to the Lord in those days. Okay, verse 1 and 2, the first part, a call to worship. We'll look at this brief. Give unto the Lord. Oh, you mighty ones, given to the Lord, glory and strength. Given to the Lord, the glory do His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I mean, every line is, is filled. It says three times, given to the Lord. It's a call for wholehearted response. He's asking, David's calling other people to give to God something that's due Him. Respond to God in a way that's worthy of who God is. That's what he's saying. Give yourself to God according to who He is. And how he's given himself to you. He's calling people to wholehearted love. He's calling people to the first commandment. Basically, he's saying, do what the angels do when you see what the angels see. See the beauty of God and you'll worship. Do what the angels do. Worship with vigor by seeing what the angels see, the beauty of the Lord. Now, obviously, we can't see with the clarity they see, but the same principle operates. We worship more when we see more. He says, give to the Lord the glory to His name. The glory to His name is wholeheartedness. That's what it's talking about. How do you do this? It says, by, the, the answer is by worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worshiping the Lord. Again, put the first commandment. 
by worshiping wholehearted love. The first commandment restored to first place in the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness is threefold. There's three dimensions to the beauty of holiness. Number one, it's the holiness of God. It's the holiness of God. And when you think of holiness, I've, I've, I've said this over, over and over over the years, but I, some of you are new here. The holiness of God, there's two main lines of thought about the holiness of God in the Scripture. The word, the root word from which the Hebrew word holy is derived means, it means other than or separated unto. The word holy means separated unto. The word holy means other than. It means you separate it from something to something else. It's kind of a basic word, but it's a very, very powerful word. Because when the word holy is used about God, it doesn't mean he's just separated from bad stuff. Therefore, he's pure. The, the word holy means that, but that's the secondary meaning. God is not just separated from wrong things. Therefore, he's pure. Again, that's an attribute of holiness. That's not the main I idea of holiness. Holiness means separated from everything that's common, i.e., everything that's created. God is totally other than everything that exists. He's transcendent is the idea. When God is called holy, He means He is separated. He's in an entirely different category from everything common like the cherubim and the seraphim and the archangels and everything less than them. Everything else is created and is therefore common to God. God is holy. He's separated. That doesn't mean He's aloof. It means He's in, an, he's in a unique, infinite superiority to everything that's common. That's what the word holy means separated from everything common. That's the primary meaning of the word holy when it's related to God. When the angels are around the throne, they're not saying, when they say holy, 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 they're not saying purity, purity, purity. You don't sin, you don't sin, you don't sin. That's not what they're saying. That is only one aspect of God's holiness is purity. They're saying totally superior to everything totally superior to everything, completely other than, completely other than, or another phrase, transcendent beauty, transcendent beauty, transcendent beauty, and that includes your wisdom, your purity, your love, your power. Everything is totally other than and superior than anything else that's common or created. That's what the word holy means. And what David is calling the people to do is to interact a little bit with the transcendence and the holiness of God. Look at the skies and go, totally other than, totally other than. Oh my God, you're so superior. I love you and you love me. It's, it's to call us into the vastness of God's superior beauty. That's what holiness means first, the holiness of God. And in His holiness, He is free from everything that's bad. But He's free... He's higher than everything that's good, too, that's created. The second way we worship God in the beauty of holiness, the first is by growing in the knowledge of His splendor and His majesty. We worship by seeing His transcendence. David says, I meditate on the glorious splendor of His majesty. I study His transcendence. I meditate on how other than He is. Because it makes my heart just alive with adoration. That's how you worship in the beauty of holiness, by by seeing God's holiness a little bit. The second way you worship in the beauty of holiness is by understanding that in redemption you have been made totally other than the rest of creation. The way that you worship in the beauty of holiness is, is by knowing your spiritual identity the day you're born again. Beloved, the day that I'm born again, the day that I'm born again, it's already, I'm connected to the Son of God as His bride. It's only a matter of time. I'm enthroned and embraced forever as His bride over all the angelic host. The beauty of holiness is when I understand the beauty of who I am the day I'm born again. There's a beauty of holiness that is true of you before you've raised one finger to change a thing. You are completely other than the rest of creation by virtue of the fact you're the bride of Christ. When that thief died on the cross and stepped over that line, you know, cross the line of, of, of eternity, and to this day you'll be with me in paradise. He died and he crossed that line. He'd only been saved, you know, about 
hour. He stepped over the line into paradise and he found out he was a king. He found out he was royalty. And he went, why didn't anybody tell me this? I would have lived different. I didn't have any idea. I wouldn't have stolen all that money if I knew I was a king. I thought I was a beggar the whole time. That's the beauty of holiness. Beloved, you're, you're kings regarding as regards to the rest of creation, but you're a queen regarding the Lord Jesus Himself and His embrace. You're the bride, you're a queen, but it, you're kings over all the works of God's hands the day you're born again. So that, there's a beauty of holiness that's automatic the moment you're born again. It's your new spiritual identity. You're loved of God. You're crowned in the glory of God. And the third way is... The third way is literally the beauty of a transformed life. Growing out of bitterness and being enslaved to just stupid, lustful passions. Well, they're not stupid in the sense we've all done them and been enslaved to them, but they're worthless passions. Let's put it that way. I mean, they make sense when we do them. It's later we wake up and go, what was, why did I do that? And there's something so fantastic about walking in mature love that is beautiful. We're, our heart, our whole experience on planet Earth is adorned in beauty when we walk in the first commandment. So there's the beauty of God, who He is, the beauty of who we are in our spiritual identity, the day we're born again, and the beauty of being transformed and literally walking as a lover of God in our living experience on the Earth. David's calling them to all three dimensions of the beauty of holiness. Now David's going to go right to an issue of God's transcendence, the storm. He's going to go right to the beauty of God's holiness. And he's going to talk about the storm now. For verse, he's, it's, it's on a, uh, 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 a stormy night or the day, or it could have gone all day. It's hard to know exactly. It says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. And by the way, the voice of the Lord is, 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 uh, is the thunderstorm. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. And the waters, he's meaning the, the watery clouds, the waters above right now. He goes, the, the God of glory thunders. The voice of God is, is, is the thunder. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. It splinters the cedars of Lebanon. It makes them skip like a calf. Lebanon. And, and Siron, like a young wild ox, the voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. That's lightning right there. Or instead of divides, put the word distributes, the lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. It shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. It strips the forest bare. And everyone in his temple says glory. That's the thunderstorm. So it's going to talk about, in verse, first I want to tell you this, there's five levels of the, of the thunderstorm in the Scripture. Five levels, and I believe David is in touch with all of them. David goes to the lowest level and describes it, and I believe every one of them have a counterpart. That's why this is a massive psalm. There's five levels to the thunderstorm. Number one, thunder is depicted as coming out of the Godhead. Four times, at least, in the book of Revelation. Revelation 4, 5 is one of them. Lightning and thunder just emanates out of the being of God. Just thunder, lightning, in eternity. At the throne of God. God just, it, the light show goes on incessantly through the ages. All diversities and administrations of thunder and lightning is always breaking out of the throne of God in various intensities and, and variations of it has nothing to do with natural creation. That's why there is natural thunder, because it exists in eternity around the throne of God. It's part of the atmosphere of the throne of God. And it comes and goes through the ages according to God's perfect desire. The second dimension of thunderstorms in the Bible is God's judgments, His wrath through history. God's judgments, His wrath through history. And they're really, they're called the thunders of God. They're culminating in the book of Revelation. The thunders of God's judgment break in upon natural history at the end of the age in a way unprecedented. His thunderous judgments crash in upon the human race in history at the end. The third dimension of thunder, of which every one of these verses has a counterpart to all five of these. 
David, I mean, he's the master poet, revelatory teacher. I mean, he's the, he knows what he's doing. I am sure David is going, oh, this will get him. <laughs> he says, Holy Spirit, when you let him peek into this, that will just stun their hearts before you. This will really get them. I mean, throughout history, when the Spirit of God opens it, your heart goes, oh. I believe, David, I believe David was in touch with what he was writing. I don't believe David was just a guy kind of out of touch. I believe he had profound understanding, not full understanding, but he, he was a poet anointed with a prophetic revelatory anointing. I mean, he was writing and he was feeling when he was writing and he liked it. The third type of thunder is God's anointed preachers in the church, the sons of thunder, John the Apostle. God raises up men and women that are thunderous, in the power of God. He calls His servants sons of thunder. Anointed preachers in the church. The fourth way of which thunder is described is trials in our own individual lives. Just the thunder, just the storms of life, the tempest of life. All the storms. David uses that all the time through Psalms. Well, he uses all these all the time, actually. I mean, he uses all of these a number of times throughout the book of Psalms. And then fifthly, is the natural storm itself. The one that's the, the least personal is the one that he paints the picture. And then those four other ways, God's heart, His majesty and eternity at the throne of God, His judgments over history, His anointed servants in the church, and difficult times in our lives, He paints the most, the, the most impersonal picture, the thunderstorm in the sky, and He gives seven different manifestations of the thunder crashing in and every one of them have an application to all five levels. And David, I believe, is operating as a prophetic, as a prophetic uh, poet. Now John the Apostle, again, he's a counterpart to David in the book of Revelation. John sees the thunder around the throne. He saw that a number four or five times in the book of Revelation. Thunder around the throne of God. John the Apostle saw the thunders of God's judgments at the end of the age. And John the Apostle knew from the Son of God Himself He was a son of thunder. He was a preacher of righteousness. He was an anointed son of thunder. So John knew those three for sure. And undoubtedly he knew about the storms of life. He watched Peter in the midst of the storm get out of the boat and walk on the water. He knows about the storms of life. So all five levels I believe we need to think on. Verse 3 and 4, the uniqueness of the voice. The uniqueness of the voice of thunder, the voice of God in all five levels. It's unique. Number one, it's over the waters. And if you read all the other Psalms, it's talking about over the clouds, the waters in, in the firmament. It comes from on high, the voice of God. And all five of those levels, the voice comes from on high. Even the natural thunderstorm, it comes from up there. It comes from on high. It's over the waters. Number two, God's thunder, whether it's His wrath, whether it's the passion within the Godhead, whether it's anointed preachers, it's powerful. It's effective to subdue everything in its path. It's powerful, it says in verse 4. It's powerful and effective. It breaks and subdues everything in its path. The thunder of God's passion in the Godhead, it, it subdues everything that's before it. The angels, the seraphim, the saints are always falling down before the thunder of God's heart. The passion of the Godhead is breaking out in majesty and they're always depicted as falling down before Him. And when the preachers of righteousness, men and women are loosed, oh, I tell you, the voice of the Lord is powerful. It comes from on heights above the waters, it's effective, and it's majestic. There's the elements of marvel and terror that are brought into that divine paradox. I mean, you look at the thunderstorm, you want to go out, but you better stay in. You want to go out, there's, there's marvel and there's terror at the same time. When the Word of God goes forth in revival, it will cause marvel and terror to hit the church. It says about the early church, they were afraid to relate to them. But there was, there's marvel and terror. When the passion of God's heart, there's marvel, but you want to go and embrace and pop him, but you fall down before him and awestruck uh, uh, worship. It's that, it's majestic, it's marvel and terror and that holy paradox put together. That's verse 3 and 4, it's unique. It it's comes from on high, it's powerful and it's majestic. Look at verse 5 to 9. 
There's seven different ways that this thunder is manifest in the theater of nature. Seven different ways. And David, see the reason I'm showing you this isn't just I want you to show you the psalm. I want you to see the, the paradigm of this worshiper of God looking around. He could just see God and all this stuff. David would, would walk around life, not that he never, he had some really low times. I mean, the Psalms are full of it. But he had those times in the Lord where his heart was just, just, just romanced by the beauty and the majesty of God. And he wanted everybody he brought into it. He said in Psalm 145, verse 5, we've said it over and over. He goes, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of his majesty. Well, that's what he was doing. In this thunderstorm, he was looking up going, oh, man, this is, oh, I love it. I love it. I want to come near, but I'm afraid to come too close. <laughs> the angels draw near and they fall down. They collapse because of the glory of the brilliance of the God they love so much. Or the God that they worship It's the God that we love. Okay, verse 5 to 9, seven features, seven manifestations of the voice of God in the theater of nature. Number one, it breaks the cedars. The cedars are always depicted in, in Israel and in, in Hebrew scriptures as the proud, the stately, the strong, the cedars of Lebanon, these l giant, expensive, fragrant, nothing breaks the cedars of Lebanon. I mean, they were the, they were the picture of stability, of fragrance, of beauty. They were, they were very expensive. Solomon built his house out of the cedars of Lebanon. I was like, whoa. You know, I had a little tag there, Cedar of Lebanon, right there. You know, everybody knew where he got it. It's my one joke of the night. Come on, you guys. <laughs> and the, when the thunder of God comes, it breaks the proud and the stately and the stable. And of course, in the preaching of the gospel, kings fall down before it. And the wrath of God on nations, nations will fall. Cedars of Lebanon will crash before God's end time judgments. The cedars... The stately ones around the throne of God collapse before His glory. And literally, the real cedars broke when the thunderstorm came. It, it was, it's true of all, and sometimes in the midst of the trials, we finally break and our pride is broken. The cedars of Lebanon is powerful enough, God's voice, to break the stately and the powerful and the unmovable. God says, I will win. You wrestle with me, I will win. I will win if you wrestle with me. He will defeat all of creation. Every cedar will be brought down low. And there's a number of places in Judges and other places of the Psalms where the cedars are pictured as proud men standing, resisting God. He says, my voice will break every stately, proud thing that stands before me. And again, those, the, the, the uh, host of heaven aren't proud, but they're the stately and the majestic. Everything breaks in the presence of the thunder of God. That's number one. Number two, it splinters them. It splinters them. Sometimes they're left standing, but they're completely disturbed and completely rearranged. He sometimes will allow that just depends. This is poetic language. He will break some and they're laying flat before God. And other times he splinters them and leaves them completely disordered and, and uh, completely disturbed from their original condition before the thunder broke in. Every city of the earth won't fall when the judgments of God's thunder come. Some will be splintered. Some will be utterly broken. Some people humble themselves entirely. Some of them are this just significantly disturbed, but they never go all the way down. God has different, different manifestations. Number six, He makes these cedars skip like a calf, and He makes the mountains. These are two mountain ranges. They skip like the wild oxen. He goes, when the thunder comes... When the thunder comes, and some people think, some of the commentaries think that David is saying that the thunder of the storm triggered the earthquake. And some say, no, the thunder was so intense, literally the mountains shook and they reverberated under the thunderous noise in, in nature. But the point is, the stable mountains and the stable trees will be shaken. They will be moved from their place. God will move mountains and He will move the stately things by His thunder. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.